Being and Caring, A Psychology for Living by Victor Daniels and Lawrence J. Horowitz, as read by The Happy President. Part 3, Living with Feeling, Chapter 12, Fear and Anxiety, Depression and Grief. We all experience death, injury, illness, separation from loved ones, and failure in our enterprises. At such times, we need to find ways to handle our suffering without being destroyed by it or adding to it. Lillian, who grew up in the South before desegregation, knew certain kinds of fear, anxiety, and attendant pain especially well. My defense, she writes, was separation and never getting involved. Therefore, I never had to risk not being accepted. In other words, I stayed in my place. It was hard to continually walk past those poor white kids calling me the N-word. It hurt inside where nobody else could see. To avoid that hurt, I learned to suppress most of my real feelings, and I did not value myself very highly. It does hurt when the need to be accepted and loved as we are goes unfulfilled. If that pain of unmet needs persists, I'm going to shut it out of my awareness. As I do, my needs that led to it may be shut out too. Or they may be filled by substitutes, as in a desperate quest for things, power, or sensations. Pain is an alarm signal. It tells me that something's wrong. I protect myself by avoiding and or reducing the trauma. But if my finger is already burned and there's nothing I can do about it, I may try to decrease the pain. Psychological pain is analogous but more complicated. At some time in my past, when painful events seemed inescapable and overwhelming, the anesthetic of drawing the curtains on painful memories and painting a kinder picture that's easier to live with was useful to me. It may be less useful now. When I deaden my ability to feel, my payoff is that I feel less pain. However, I also feel less pleasure, though I may not realize that. And I create physical pain in the muscles of my body as I literally tighten up against the psychological pain. As a result, certain places in my body never get the rest and relaxation they need. Beatrice, a college senior, recalls, During a massage training session, as two masseuses worked on my chest, I began to laugh uncontrollably. The instructor immediately came over, placed his thumbs on two points on my chest, and encouraged me to breathe deeply. My laughter turned into wild crying. Later on, I found out that my explosive crying covered great pain. When I had experienced that pain deeply, it gave way to love and joy. Fear. Fear and pain are close associates. I need and want some of my fears. They have survival value, helping me survive dangerous situations, avoid needless injuries, and escape unnecessary pain. A commitment to being cool can diminish our appropriate fears about such dangers as nuclear waste and the abuse of dangerous drugs, so we're willing to gamble when there is no winning. But too much fear can lead to mistakes in thinking and behavior and make it hard to concentrate or remember crucial information. Several problems are associated with learning based on fear. First, it can be unusually difficult to change. The unlearning and relearning process is slow. As a result, some fears that once protected us now confine us. Since my fear impels me to avoid or escape from situations like those that were threatening in the past, at an emotional level, I never fully recognize that the old dangers are gone or greatly diminished. Second, fear can stop me from perceiving what actually exists and lead me to think I perceive things that aren't there. When this is extreme, it's paranoia. Of course, my fears may not be paranoid. During the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, many people who were afraid the CIA and FBI were watching them were considered paranoid. Later, it turned out that they were right. So I need to keep my capacity to check the message I'm getting from my fears against other information. 
Third, fear generalizes easily to other events that resemble the ones we're afraid of. An increasing area of our power and potential becomes off limits, not only specifically punished fear-inducing act, but also others associated with it. If I get my time tangled up when I'm with an authority, for instance, I may be protecting myself against saying something that might get me in trouble, or that might have done so long ago, even though it wouldn't now. Disguised fears. We disguise some of our fears in ways that deceive us, our enemies, and even potential friends. With the right combination of fears, I can convince myself that I'm so inadequate that the moment a new relationship starts, I'm ready to be rejected. To protect against that, I may come on as tough, indifferent, or superior. In response, you back away. Even though we may be both be attracted to each other. Though I may want to make contact desperately, I use my fear, and my fear of my fear, to keep myself isolated and lonely. When fear masquerades as anger, or vice versa, conflicts between individuals and nations become more than they were intended to be. It's hard to disengage from fear-based anger, with the frequent result that so much is invested in so little. Fear can be disguised as strength. Strength that's based on inner security shows up not in domination of others, but in the kind of self-trust that makes it unnecessary for an individual to be forever proving his prowess. When fear is disguised as goodness, we can identify a tendency to define virtue in terms of refraining from, of resisting temptation rather than affirming life. Such goodness, with its many taboos and prohibitions, may self-righteously condemn those viewed as less moral. Critics of Western religions condemn the fear-guilt-retribution triumvirate as the base of some churches' theologies. Within the churches themselves are movements actively seeking to reduce fear as the incentive for religious commitment and substitute a more loving basis for a relationship with God. Fear can even be disguised as love. If I'm afraid you may become too independent and not need me as much as I want you to, I may be possessive, jealous, and excessively helpful as I try to keep you from developing the ability to take care of yourself. You can see this happen with spouses, lovers, and children. One fear common to most of us involves being found out. Our secrets are things we keep hidden because we're ashamed or embarrassed. You know they're so terrible that others would want nothing more to do with you if they knew about them. Terror. At times the word fear is not enough to describe the way I feel. Once when I was skin diving from opposite sides of a coral reef, an enormous shark and I swam face to face 30 feet apart. Instantly, I was in a state of full-blown terror. Sometimes these are stages. I begin with just a vague sense of discomfort. I'm a little uneasy, a little jumpy. Then I start getting anxious. The event I'm concerned about is getting larger. I'm reacting more. I'm not sure I have all the resources I need to handle it. I begin to be afraid. The power of the event grows as it looms in my thinking. The feared aspects begin to get more focused, closer. I feel less and less adequate to deal with the situation. The event grows even larger. I'm feeling more and more helpless, and that's when terror strikes. The situation has become more than I believed myself capable of dealing with. Inside, if not observably, I start to shake and tremble. In my terror, as I'm frantically looking around for resources, I conclude that nothing I do or don't do will affect what happens. The event grows still larger and closer, and I panic. One aspect of this process is the presence of anxiety throughout all its stages, my apprehension about what's going to happen. Another component is starting out thinking I have the resources to deal with whatever's coming up and using them fully to no avail. That's, that's the point, and I have no resources left, that I want a competent counsel available, one who won't respond by prescribing a tranquilizer and telling me not to worry. 
Feeling terrified may or may not have a concrete, observable basis. Fears from my past may combine with my present circumstances in some unexpected, subjectively overwhelming way. My inner demons, if you will, start to rattle their chains, moan their moans, or do nothing but stand there staring at me. Or my terror may be based on well-defined circumstances. In the paratroops in World War II, I was working in intelligence before a major jump. As information arrived, we were constructing the sand table, a three-dimensional map of the drop zone. As more and more data came in, the chilling realization took form that there appeared to be no way of living through the mission. I went through all the stages of fear just described as that conclusion became more and more inescapable, and I went emotionally dead with my feeling of being unable to do anything to change the circumstances. When we were about to take off, word came that Patton's tanks had just rolled through the drop zone. The combat veterans were very quiet. The new recruits whooped, joked, and some even protested. We don't have to pretend we're not afraid when in fact we are. Children's fears are to be appreciated as their reality. Many children are afraid when they're alone in bed at night. In one study, 40% of two-year-olds were afraid of the dark. In that shadowy, silent time, all a child's fears can surface, though the child may minimize them by saying they're caused by bears, robbers, or the noises and shadows of the night. I wish we could all agree that it's all right to be afraid and not be ashamed of our fearfulness. In our own ways, we are all afraid. Anxiety. The line between anxiety and fear is sharp and clear at some points, while at others it blurs and disappears. We speak of fear when we think we know what we're afraid of, and anxiety when we're unsure. Psychiatrist Clarence J. Rowe defines anxiety as an unpleasant uneasiness, apprehension, uncertainty, agitation, or dread that stems from an unidentified, anticipated danger. Even the definition is scary. Anxiety and worry are also related. A student whose anxiety is connected to writing difficulties reports, I've barely begun to write my term paper and already I'm worrying that it won't be good enough and I might not get the grade I want. Anxieties like these snowball. My grade point average won't be good. I might not get into the other half of my scholarship and I won't be able to stay in school. I get immobilized, block the flow of my thoughts and feelings and can't write. But anxiety has its positive side. In an intriguing study, social psychologist Irving Janis interviewed patients facing surgery and divided them into three groups. Non-anxious patients were cheerful and optimistic about the surgery and slept well the night before. Moderately anxious patients reported some tension. They wanted reassurance and information about the surgeon's procedures. Highly anxious patients were jittery, couldn't sleep, and were extremely worried about complications and possible death. How did these three groups respond to the surgery? The moderately anxious patients recovered fastest, handled the post-operative procedures best, and had the highest morale. In that situation, concluded Janice, moderate anxiety is healthy and desirable. The same is probably true for numerous other stressful situations. Anxiety may be classified as acute or chronic. Acute anxiety comes quickly, is intense, and is soon over. It's a transitory response to a troubling situation. Chronic anxiety is less intense and lasts much longer. But for a lifetime? Anxiety can develop in connection with our defenses against deeper fears, painful memories, or terrifying aspects of the world around us that we don't wish to recognize. The inevitable fragility of strategies of avoidance results in a pervasive, vague anxiety that leaves us overwhelmed. This has been called neurotic anxiety. Many of us feel at least a little of it. When I notice that I'm tensing up physically, I can unclench my hands, loosen my stomach and shoulders, breathe deeply, and sometimes even unhook from my anxiety response. But if I'm anxious without realizing it, as many of us often are, I don't have that choice. 
Existential anxiety. Psychoanalyst Karen Horney suggested that most children experience some measure of basic anxiety, a sense of being isolated and helpless in a potentially hostile world. This insecurity can be triggered by a wide range of events, such as domination, indifference, disparagement, or overprotection. This basic anxiety, Horney maintained, limits a child's ability to relate to others spontaneously. He must deal with them in ways which do not arouse or increase, but rather allay his basic anxiety. In an adult, she continues, that basic anxiety has either decreased or has become overlaid with other anxieties. In many adults, it is replaced by existential anxiety. Pain, tragedy, separation, and death touch us all, as do such larger circumstances as the prospect of nuclear war and the poisoning of our earth. These are not small matters. We have a choice. One option is to confront our anxieties about those events, do what we can about the events themselves, and handle our anxieties in ways that keep them from impairing or destroying our ability to relax and enjoy ourselves. The other option is to block off our anxiety by restricting our awareness. Rollo May maintains that as we mature, we can perceive and accept an increasingly open world with more possibilities for pain as well as pleasure. James Bugenthal adds that when we exercise our freedom and make a choice, we administer death to other alternatives. Thus, life always includes the existential anxiety that goes along with the large and small deaths of giving up other possibilities. Ernst Becker identifies our ambivalence about knowing making such decisions as the crux of anxiety. To decide and act knowingly, he says, is to be visible and responsible and alive. To avoid doing so is to be invisible, not accountable, and dead. Anxiety surrounds each journey from the old and familiar through the unknown territory into new ways and possibilities. Some of us try to invent a completely predictable existence and learn only grudgingly that life lived fully is always a balance between resting in the familiar and stretching for the unknown. Uncertainty and excitement. Anxiety, declares Pearls, is the tension between the now and the later. When I'm completely in the present, actively responding to what is happening in this situation, I have minimal room for anxiety about what's going to happen. In Pearl's model of anxiety, when I become interested in something, I get excited. My mind and body differentiate this excitement into feeling, feelings of attraction, revulsion, anger, fear, joy, and so on. This emotional excitement, in turn, energizes my muscular system. You can't imagine anger, he states, or joy, without muscular movement. These muscles are used to move about, to touch the world, to be in contact. When my excitement does not find its way into movement and activity, Pearl suggests, I experience anxiety, which is bottled up excitement. This suppression of any excitement, not just fear, produces anxiety. So I become anxious when I want to respond but hold back, out of my uncertainty about whether what I do will bring applause or rotten eggs. To realize that the rotten eggs are not a catastrophe, but just an unpleasantness, comments Pearls, is part of waking up. A crucial element in anxiety is restricting my breathing. If I'm excited, I need more oxygen. When I breathe deeply, I move toward being alive with my excitement. When I hold my breath, I move toward being paralyzed in my fear. Even though I feel anxious and I can't do anything about what's going to happen, I can take care of myself by becoming aware of what I'm doing now. If I'm anxious about getting up and talking before a group in three minutes, I can notice how I experience that anxiety at this moment in my breathing my heartbeat, and elsewhere in my body. My existential choices are clear. I can move with my excitement into aliveness or freeze myself into immobility. There is anxiety in either direction.
Now, what do I want? Diffusing fears and anxieties. As any demolition expert will tell you, diffusing is delicate work where we take the destructive potential out of a possibly explosive event. It requires appropriate knowledge and careful, sometimes courageous, handling of the situation. In emotional diffusing, we work either with memories of early experience or with present life situations to reduce the power of whatever formerly triggered the anxiety. Most strategies for diffusing fears and anxieties, whatever specific form they take, involve two essential elements. First, repeated safe contact with a situation that resembles the one in which my fear or anxiety was originally learned. Safe contact involves support, reassurance, and non-judgmental confrontation in a situation that induces only a moderate level of fear or anxiety, a level I can handle, and in which, unlike the original situation, nothing threatening happens. Since in the past my fear or anxiety led me to avoid such situations and not confront or experience them, I never learned that they're no longer so threatening as they once were. Second, Second I learned a new response that's incompatible with fear or anxiety to replace my old fearful response. I learn, for example, relaxation techniques and how to use them between confrontations with threatening material. Relaxation and fear are psychologically and physically incompatible. If I learn to relax in a situation I used to fear, I'll be less afraid. In the basic desensitization process for getting rid of old fears and anxieties, as again and again I act in ways that resemble the way I'm afraid to act or experience the situation that arouses my anxiety, and no harm comes to me. Eventually, my entire body learns that nothing bad will happen when I act that way, especially if I consciously relax whenever I feel my fear or anxiety emerging. If my fear is strong, I don't want to start right off doing something that's very similar to what I'm afraid to do. Using the principle of successive approximation, I begin with situations that are only a little like the one I fear and gradually move to situations that are more like it. Systematic desensitization. This highly structured approach developed by Joseph Wolpe is ideal for fears and anxieties that are so powerful you completely shy away from events related to them. Systematic desensitization is useful not only for a fear so strong that you feel uncomfortable doing things even remotely related to it, but also for fears and anxieties about things that happen with no action on your part, like sudden loud noises. The effectiveness of this process depends on your ability to visualize and fantasize. Begin by thinking about your fear or anxiety until you can describe a specific situation in which you'd expect to feel it at its maximum intensity. Write that down in precise detail. Now jot down a variety of other situations also related to that most feared event that you can either create for yourself or put yourself into, some that are similar to the most feared event and others that are only a little like it and hence less frightening. Write each item on a separate strip of paper so you can move them around easily. A woman afraid of heights, for example, included standing on a kitchen chair, descending steep bleacher steps, and moving in a high-rise elevator among her mild items, and being at the top of a Ferris wheel, standing near the edge of a cliff, and rock climbing near the top. When you have a list of at least 10 situations, Order them from the least to the most frightening. Check your ranking by having another person read off each situation as you sit or lie with your eyes closed. If they're ranked correctly, you'll feel just a little more fear with each successive situation you imagine. If you feel less fear with an item than with the previous one, reverse their order. If you notice a big jump in fear from one item to the next, Think of one or two more items that will fit between these two so that the increase in fear is small. These scenes have to be specific. 
so that when the description is read, a particular scene comes immediately to mind. When you have your list, or a desensitization hierarchy, sit back in a comfortable armchair, or better yet, lie down in a place where you feel secure, and take at least 10 minutes to relax completely. Then allow a calm scene where you feel very good and happy to come into your mind. A beach, a spot on a riverbank, perhaps a favorite place from your memories. Vividly imagine yourself there, feeling as relaxed and good as you can. Next, switch to vividly imagining the least frightening item on your list. When you begin to feel afraid, remove your attention from the threatening item, go back to your pleasant scene, and relax your body again. When tension becomes minimal, again imagine being in the threatening situation. Continue this alternation until you remain relaxed and unafraid as you imagine the previously threatening situation. Then continue to the next item on your list. Doing three or four items a day in a session lasting an hour or so is plenty. Sometimes you may even need to devote an entire session to a single item. This procedure works most effectively if you do it with a partner who reads the scene from your list for you to imagine and gives you relaxation instructions whenever you hold up a finger indicating that you feel any fear or any tension in your body. In vivo desensitization. In vivo here means in the real life situation. In this approach, you begin by making a list as described above and then physically go through each situation on your list, beginning with the easiest one and gradually moving to more frightening ones. You might want to go through a given kind of situation several times before moving to the next item on your list or you might skip certain items. In vivo desensitization and systematic desensitization can be combined. You can put your emphasis on working with fantasy scenes, incorporating real life events when feasible. Or you can emphasize going through real life situations using fantasy as an adjunct when needed. Modeling. Behavioral psychologist Albert Bandura has developed an approach to reducing fears and anxieties based on the fact that imitation is one of our basic ways of learning. He has emphasized the role of a model who handles the threatening situation comfortably. Many people, for instance, are afraid of snakes. If I'm the fearful person, fearless Bandura's strategy would be to handle the snake in front of me. If my fear is strong enough, I might begin by watching through a window while he handles the snake in a neighboring room. Once I'm willing to enter the room with the snake, there's more modeling by others interacting comfortably with it. When I'm ready to touch it myself, I don't have to figure out how to do it. Since someone has just shown me, I need only imitate what the model does. Then I experience the reward of knowing that I've touched the snake successfully and also the reward of approval by others present. After watching the model some more, I may progress to picking up the snake and holding it in my hand. Watching alone is not enough. I must also participate by doing as the model did. Such sequences of modeling and imitation typically involve a graduated presentation of increasingly difficult tasks. Sometimes Bandura uses response induction aids, like a pair of heavy gloves for handling the snake until I'm comfortable without them. The most, the most powerful, powerful model, it turns out, out, is often not the practiced expert, a mastery model, but rather someone who's just a little beyond the point of successfully doing what the fearful person wants to do, a coping model. Repetition is also important. The decrease in fear or anxiety is more pronounced and more permanent, Bandura found, if a person practices doing what he or she was formerly afraid to do over and over again. In daily life, when I'm trying to help someone else overcome a fear of something I'm not afraid of, I have the advantage of a built-in model, me. When my young daughter was taking Tadpole 1 swimming lessons, she faced a fear common to many of the children in her class, fear of putting her face underwater. With that and related fears, 
the instructor first modeled the desired behavior and then used more advanced children in the class as a model for the others, being careful to accept each child's present behavior and feelings at each moment. Once you've become less fearful about something, expose yourself to such situations on a regular basis if you have a chance to. That will help keep your old fears and anxieties from returning. Depression. Going anywhere seems to go nowhere. Doing anything seems to mean nothing. I've got the blues. The blues are a universal experience. We all feel happy and sad, elated and depressed. The trouble comes when we get depressed and can't seem to get out of it. When I'm stuck in my depression, after a while I feel frustrated and bored with where I am and what I'm doing. Each new avenue I take seems dark and shrouded. Since no pathway I see looks promising, I may stop trying any of them. The experience and meaning of depression. Along with feeling down in the dumps, my depression may be seasoned with dashes of anxiety, irritability, or guilt. It's a statement of my unexpressed and unrecognized anger. It can involve social withdrawal and loss of interest in activities that used to be enjoyable. My deluxe depression may include self-blame, indecision, thinking that life is meaningless and futile, and a sense of worthlessness or helplessness. On good days, I can mask depressed feelings with compulsive sex, drinking, overeating, or smoking. B.F. Skinner speaks of depression as the loss of accustomed rewarding events. In response, I feel deprived, apathetic, and perhaps angry and helpless. The rewards may even have been only expected rather than experienced, for I may be just as depressed over unrequited love as over love lost. Many young people get depressed when they move away from home and its host of environmental supports. That kind of depression tends to fade as a person makes the transition toward self-support. Following up on the idea that depression is related to not getting enough enjoyment out of life, Peter Lewinson and his colleagues found that depressed persons report a lower daily average of pleasant activities, lower rates of social activity, and more discomfort dealing with others, at least in groups and in situations that require assertiveness. They also discovered that depressed behavior is sometimes unwittingly encouraged and maintained by well-meaning sympathy and support. A certain amount of, yeah, that's tough, is appropriate, but after that, forget it, you're just wallowing in it, may be kinder. Martin Seligman and his colleagues identified learned helplessness as an aspect of depression. Many depressed people, they discovered, at some point spend considerable time in a situation where their actions had little effect on what happened to them. They learn to view events as uncontrollable, that life is based on luck. If I believe that only lucky people succeed, and I don't seem to be lucky, I may feel apathetic and powerless. I can feel depressed even when good things happen to me, when they occur without regard to what I've done, and I feel helpless to maintain that good fortune. My blue skies are always dark blue. Seligman's group hypothesized that when depressed people fail at something, they lay the blame on themselves, but when successful, they place the credit elsewhere. Thus, developing a sense of being able to affect what happens to me can be important in moving out of depression. Exploring depression. Mostly, I want to get rid of my depression and feel better, but not always. At times, I want to feel what I'm feeling, both to live the experience and because there may be some deepening of understanding that comes out of it for me. Next time you feel depressed, notice your thoughts, your feelings, your sensations. Be interested in your own depression and use the tool of the awareness continuum to observe yourself there. You can feel your depression as a vague, amorphous whole and feel it in its nuances, changes, and details. You can become an expert on the subject of your own depression. 
Sometimes people like to do routine tasks when they're depressed. That can be done with the mind and feeling spinning around out of touch with the here and now, or it can be done with presence and focus. When I'm right on the ragged edge, I find comfort in doing something very simple, like scrubbing floors or washing windows, my car, or me, slowly and with awareness of what I'm doing in each moment. Searching for the function our depression serves is longer and more complicated. It takes us examining our fantasies and dreams, pointing to our unfulfilled and dissatisfied aspects. It's apt to be trying to tell me I need to make some kind of important change, though I may not know what that is. But when I'm depressed, I feel little energy for finding out how to give vitality to the parts of me that hold promise. I repeat my safe, ineffective ways and reinforce my illusions and your view of my helplessness. Alternatively, I can start moving out of my depression toward new ways to meet my needs and begin to follow through on involvements and projects. Sometimes the statement the depression is making comes out fairly and easily, and sometimes not. Things become more complicated when my helpless depression has evolved into my way of relating and controlling my relationship with you. You may support me as a way of being my strength and rescuer. Thanks. Moving out of depression. Just as the sources of depression differ from one person to another, so do the processes for moving out of it. For some of us, strengthening underdeveloped social competencies helps through assertion training, learning to communicate clearly, etc. For others, learning to express feelings that have been held in is crucial. One kind of depression has been called frozen rage. It occurs in people who have learned no way to express their anger. Howard, for example, came in for therapy because he had recurrent seizure-like tremors for which his doctor could find no physiological reason. He was extremely depressed and locked up his anger tightly. In a counseling session, as he began to express his anger toward his father, he cut himself off abruptly and his whole body went into a violent spasmodic tremor, a muscular expression of his withholding of his intense feelings. Learning to describe and express his resentments and anger helped Howard deal with his depression and decreased his tremors. According to psychiatrist Aaron Beck, we become depressed when we view ourselves as deprived, deficient, or defeated. This 3D devil expresses itself in a paralysis of will and a lack of motivation. Anticipating failure, I'm unlikely to undertake much activity, and when I feel like a burden to others, I avoid socializing. One dimension of feeling inadequate is feeling victimized. In this self-pitying state, I keep repeating to myself, and perhaps to others, statements about being overwhelmed, incompetent, and oppressed. Once I recognize this cycle of self-pity, I have the option of doing something else instead. Psychiatrist A. John Rush suggests confronting thought processes that contribute to feeling worthless and inept by using the triple column technique. Divide a piece of paper into three columns. Title the first column, specific events associated with unpleasant feelings. The second column, thought. And the third column, evidence for or against the thought. When an event you feel depressed about occurs, fill in the three columns. In Rush's example, a young woman wrote, attended football game and felt depressed and despondent in the first column. The thought, cognition, that led to her feeling that was, I was a boring date. Her evidence for concluding that was, my date concentrated on the game rather than me. But when she listed all the other evidence she had available, it included his explaining what was going on in the game to her, being very attentive to her when they went out to dinner afterward, and friends telling her that he was shy. Taken all together, the information contradicted the thoughts that led to her feeling depressed. Grief. When you are sorrowful, writes the Lebanese philosopher poet Khalil Gibran, you are weeping for that which has been your delight. 
Grief involves loss of a friendship, job, possession, opportunity, stage in life, or a family member or intimate companion. The pain of grief involves wanting what was to continue as we prepare to live with what is. Josephine, a woman in her 60s, writes, When my first counseling session began, I was surprised when suddenly I found myself weeping for my husband Carrie, now dead four years. I had been fearful of going back into those terrible, engulfing moments when the irreversible truth that he was gone forever swept over me. It was a real fight to get back to trusting my emotions. Feeling and Expressing Grief and Sadness Kubler-Ross and others identify various stages in the grieving process. These stages can occur with smaller losses as well, like a child losing its favorite toy. The first stage is shock or denial. In my dazed disbelief, I can distort reality and move to recover the lost person or object. Then a stage of resentment, anger, or rage may occur. Outraged, I storm at the universe for taking who or what I loved away. I may even feel resentment or anger at the departed person or other object of loss. This gives way to despair or depression, including mental anguish, feeling empty and helpless, and loss of hope. Then there is an acceptance and recovery stage in which I learn to live with the loss. It becomes part of me and my past, and I go on with life. A grieving person may fluctuate back and forth through those phases. Mark took his young son on a group camping trip. Mark's son died on the trip. No one really knew what happened. One morning, he just didn't wake up. Despite the exceptional anguish that the death of a child can bring, the well-meaning minister told the family not to grieve because the boy was with the angels. For six months, the family members pretended they had no grief, and the tensions almost destroyed the family. When they finally acknowledged they were bottling up their sorrow and gave themselves permission to mourn, they began to be able to talk to each other again. When someone I love dies, I want to feel my grief fully, even if that means sitting back and howling. At such times, I don't need any restraint on the intensity of my feelings. If I go through the depths of my sorrow, I feel less need to hang on to it and I have a better chance to come out on the other side well and whole again. In India, there is a tradition that when someone dies, the person that was closest to the departed one repeats the story of the death to each new visitor, and the visitor often replies with a story of his or her own loss and grief. In retelling the event, the bereaved person gradually begins to live with the fact of the death and sometimes notices, this woman I'm talking to who has tears in her eyes, it's her loss too. I don't feel so alone in my grief. The awareness of death becomes a part of the process of life. When someone I love dies or we part ways, I may lose more than that person. I also face losing part of myself that was called out by that person. So as I grieve, I want to offer that part of myself a chance to keep on living. Some of us suppress the urge to cry when we feel it. I want, however, to respect myself and my ability to feel my sadness fully and put aside my inhibiting controls and fears. New lines of research suggest that healthy crying may have positive physiological effects, breaking down certain toxins in a person's system. Many women in our culture have learned to use crying to cover other emotions. Just as anger can mask grief, for instance, crying can mask anger. Tears that nourish don't sting. When my crying leaves me feeling cleansed, refreshed, and awakened, it's nourishing. When my tears hide other feelings, my eyes burn and my tears have a salty sting. That kind of crying can also be a way I avoid contact with you or manipulate you. It would be an error to make a crying a should. Some people have other ways to express their sadness and simply don't cry or feel an urge to. Others cry only when happy. Whatever your manner of expressing it, 
When you are in sorrow, go ahead. Be sorrowful. Being in that state contains the key to transformation. The feelings you have avoided are still there and will be until you live them through. If you're sorrowful but can't bear the pain, unfortunately, there's no way you can make it vanish from your life and your memories. In your living through it, you become better able to help yourself and others. Terminal illness. A terminally ill person is dealing with death, with feelings about losing his or her reason or control, and with concerns about burdening family members, about separation, and perhaps about not completing important tasks or other obligations. The family mirrors many of these fears. Family members may be afraid they'll be unable to handle the stress of caregiving or the financial burden. They're afraid of what losing the ill person will mean to the family. They're afraid the death itself may be painful or ugly. Sometimes a conspiracy of silence is maintained which the family knows the worst and keeps it from the ill member. In most cases, the person is fully aware of the severity of the illness and doesn't need protection. A conspiracy of silence denies everybody the chance to deal directly with anxiety, share remaining pleasures, plan realistically for the future, and have the important intimate exchanges that they all need. It is tragic when after the death, for years or perhaps a lifetime, each person in the family carries a burden of unfinished things I wish I'd said. By contrast, several years ago when a cousin-in-law of mine who was the father of five died, everything was in the open. Despite the difficulties and demands on their energy, the family cared for John at home during his last months rather than sending him to the hospital. They had many long conversations and deep sharing. Things that had been left unsaid in the past were said along with present feelings. When I visited before his death, we had a long, moving conversation that's an important part of my memory of him now. Avoiding unnecessary suffering. About a third of our suffering is inevitable, said Buddha, but we ourselves create the rest of it. We can learn to diminish that other two thirds. If I'm alive, I experience sadness as well as joy, pain as well as pleasure. I needlessly oppress myself if I think that my life is not the way it should be. I don't need the extra suffering of thinking, I shouldn't be suffering right now. As Hobart Thomas sums it up, I belong to this realm of tears and beauty, the earth. Death. The more directly I confront the inevitability of my death, the more fully I can be alive now. A human life is like that moment when a raindrop skates and bounces on the surface of the ocean before merging with the sea, says biologist Don Isaac. My life is brief, and when I die, the great stream of life itself goes on, reborn in new bodies and new forms, evolving onward from its ancient origin. Our human life but dies down to its root, says Thoreau, and still puts forth its green blade to eternity. In our culture, we shy away from accepting death as part of our process. Funerals and everything associated with them are often mechanical and antiseptic. Death itself is an event that seldom comes up in our speech. By shying away from facing the prospect of my death, I avoid considering what it means in terms of the way I live my life. Jeannie's father died slowly, and they spent several weeks together before he died. As he reviewed his life, he talked most about the opportunities he'd missed, the things he would have done but didn't. I said no to life too many times, Jeannie, he said. I hope you don't do the same. His words helped Jeannie make some major changes. She changed jobs, developed new friends, became meaningfully involved in her community, and took a vacation she'd be talking about for years. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, a Chicago psychiatrist, interviewed several hundred people who were revived after they'd been declared medically dead. We came to fantastic findings, terribly intriguing, she says, 
These people describe how they float out of their body. They have a feeling of peace and wholeness, a tremendous feeling of stopped all this attempt to revive me. I'm all right. Not one of them has ever been afraid to die again. Some of us let our individual identity die by identifying ourselves completely with some mass organism, i.e. the company, the corporation, or the agency. Authors believe that books live beyond their lives. This pseudo-immortality we gain through such identification can lead to neglecting the sources of nourishment we need to keep ourselves alive as individuals. While old age is seen as a prelude to dying, it is also a place to do another kind of living. Take kindly the counsel of the years, gracefully surrendering the things of youth, says the desiderata. As we surrender the things of youth, we can gradually enter into the things of maturity and age. In proportion as we live fully in the now of each day and each time in our lives, we can love and laugh and play in all the seasons of our years. End of chapter 12.